Good evening and a very warm welcome to St Mary's Evensong this evening. And there is a resurrection theme to our readings today, well certainly to our second reading. And we're going to think about what the um, meaning of the resurrection is for us as Christians today, as we hear about Peter's release from jail in our second reading. So we're going to begin our worship by singing together that wonderful Easter hymn, Thine Be the Glory. Beloved brethren, the scripture moveth us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness, and that we should not dissemble nor cloak them before the face of Almighty God our Heavenly Father, but confess them with an humble, lowly, penitent and obedient heart, to the end that we may obtain forgiveness of the same by his infinite goodness and mercy. And although we ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before God, yet ought we most chiefly so to do. When we assemble and meet together to render thanks for the great benefits that we have received at his hands, to set forth his most worthy praise, to hear his most holy word, and to ask those things which are requisite and necessary as well for the body as the soul. Wherefore I pray and beseech you, as many as are here present, to accompany me with a pure heart and humble voice unto the throne of the heavenly grace, saying with me. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, 
and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind, in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, and hath given power and command to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardoneth and absolveth all them that truly repent and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that we may at the last come to his eternal joy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And our mouth shall show forth thy praise. O oh God, make speed to save us. O oh Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be world without end. Amen. Praise be the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Our psalm this evening is Psalm number 75 and is being led for us by Max this evening.
Our first reading this evening comes from the first book of Kings, chapter 6, beginning at verse 11, and it's read by Bernie Sitwell. Bernie may be having a little trouble unmuting herself. We'll just give her a little while to get that sorted out because she was managing, she managed to do it earlier. Can you hear me now? Yeah, that's better. Lovely. So, so sorry. Right. <laughs> Now the word of the Lord came to Solomon concerning this house that you're building. If you will walk in my statutes, obey my ordinances and keep all my commandments by walking in them, then I will establish my promise with you, which I made to your father, David. I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people, Israel. So Solomon built the house and finished it. In the inner sanctuary, he made two cherubim of olive wood, each 10 cubits high. Five cubits was the length of one wing of the cherub, and five cubits the length of the other wing of the cherub. It was 10 cubits from the tip of one wing to the tip of the other. The other cherub also cher measured 10 cubits. Both cherubim had the same measure and the same form. The height of one cherub was 10 cubits, and so was the part of the other cherub. He put the cherubim in the innermost part of the house. The wings of the cherubim were spread out so that a wing of one was touching one wall and a wing of the other cherub was touching the other wall. Their other wings towards the center of the house were touching wing to wing. He also overlaid the cherubim with gold. He carved the walls of the house all around about with carved engravings of cherubim palm trees and open flowers in the inner and outer rooms. The floor of the house he overlaid with gold in the inner and outer rooms. For the entrance to the inner sanctuary he made doors of olive wood. The lintel and the doorstep but doorposts were five-sided. He covered the two doors of olive wood with carvings of cherubim, palm trees and open flowers. He overlaid them with gold and spread gold on the cherubim and on the palm trees. So also he made for the entrance to the nave doorposts of olive wood, each four-sided and two doors of cypress wood. The two leaves of one door were folding and the two leaves of the other door were folding. He carved cherubim, palm trees and open flowers and overlaying them with gold evenly applied upon the carved work. He built the inner court with three courses of dressed stone to one course of cedar beams. In the fourth year of the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid in the month of Ziv. In the eleventh year, in the month of Bull, which is the eighth month, the house is finished in all its parts and according to all its specifications. He was seven years in building it. Here end is the first lesson. Thank you, Bernie. We're now going to say the Magnificat together. My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Saviour, for he hath regarded the lowliness of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath magnified me, and holy is his name and his mercy is on them that fear him throughout all generations. He hath shown strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seat and hath exalted the humble and meek. He hath filled the hungry with good things and the rich he hath sent empty away. He remembering his mercy hath holpen his servant Israel as he promised to our forefathers Abraham and his seed forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, 
and shall be ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our next reading comes from the book of Acts, chapter 12, beginning at verse 1, and is read for us this evening by Mary Ann. King Herod laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He had James, the brother of John, killed with the sword. After he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the festival of unleavened bread. When he had seized him, he put him in prison and handed him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending to bring him out to the people after the Passover. While Peter was in, kept in prison, the church prayed fervently to God for him. The very night before Herod was going to bring him out, Peter, bound with two chains, was sleeping between two soldiers, while guards in front of the door were keeping watch over the prison. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He tapped Peter on the side and woke him, saying, get up quickly, and the chains fell off his wrists. The angel said to him, fasten your belt and put on your sandals. He did so. Then he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. Peter went out and followed him. He did not realise what was happening with the angel's help was real. He thought he was seeing a vision. After they had passed the first and the second guard, they came before the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord and they went outside and walked along a lane when suddenly the angel left them. Then Peter came to himself and said, now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hands of Herod, from all that the Jewish people were expecting. As soon as he realised this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many had gathered and were praying. When he knocked at the outer gate, a maid named Rhoda came to answer. On recognising Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that, instead of opening the gate, she ran in and announced that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you're out of your mind. But she insisted that it was so. They said, it is his angel. Meanwhile, Peter continued knocking. And when they opened the gate, they saw him and were amazed. He motioned to them to be with his hand to be silent and described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. Then he added, tell this to James and to the believers. Then he left and went to another place. Here endeth the second lesson. Thank you, Mary Ann. We're now going to say the Nunc Dimittis together. Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, to be a light to lighten the Gentiles, and to be the glory of thy people Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And now we say the Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have 
have mercy upon us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us. And grant us thy salvation. O Lord, take the Queen. And mercifully hear us when we call upon thee. And hear thy ministers with righteousness. And make thy chosen people joyful. Oh Lord, save thy people. And bless thine inheritance. Give peace in our time, O oh Lord. Because there is none other that fighteth for us, but only thou, O oh God. within us and take not thy holy spirit from us lord of all power and might who art the author and giver of all good things graft in our hearts the love of thy name increase in us true religion nourish us with all goodness and of thy great mercy keep us in the same through jesus christ thy son our lord who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. O God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works do proceed, give unto thy servants that peace which the world cannot give, that both our hearts may be set to obey thy commandments, and also that by thee, we being defended from the fear of our enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Lighten our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord, and by thy great mercy, defend us from all perils and dangers of this night, for the love of thine only Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. This evening we have an anthem from the choir. They are going to be singing Lift Up Thine Eyes from Mendelssohn, by Mendelssohn.
May the words of my lips and the meditation of all our hearts be now and always acceptable to you, O Christ, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Can you believe it? It's one of the great questions raised by the resurrection, if you'll excuse the pun. Even for the writers of the New Testament and the first disciples, it is a central question. On the one hand, the resurrection is fundamentally unbelievable. Then as now, we know people don't come back from the dead. Yet we know that Peter saw the empty tomb and the angel and met the resurrected Christ on Easter day and on several subsequent occasions. And that was all after he had spent three years following Jesus witnessing many healings, the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus walking on water, and all the other miracles that the Gospels record. So when you hear the story of Peter's freeing from jail, jail from that perspective, you might equally ask, why couldn't he believe it? Why is it that when the angel comes to set him free, he thinks it's just a vision? Perhaps it was because of what had just happened to his close friend, James, John's brother. Our reading from Acts today starts by telling us that Herod had just arrested and killed James. It must have been a terrible shock for the church as a whole, but in particular for Peter and John, James's brother, those three disciples who were with Jesus at some of the most critical moments of his ministry. James wasn't the first member of the church to be killed, that was Stephen, but he was the first of the original 12 disciples to die. From what Luke says in Acts, it seems likely that James's death and Peter's arrest came within days or weeks of one another. And I'm sure the shock of it must have been quite terrible for Peter and the other disciples and how must have led them to wonder if God had allowed James to die and had not intervened to save him. When Peter was arrested, I expect that he would not have expected things to be any different for him either. And of course, for us too, it raises the question, why did God save Peter and not James? And if we think forward, we might also wonder why God chose to save Peter on this occasion, but did not save him from being martyred with Paul in Rome some years later. When we say the creed, we say that we believe in the resurrection of the dead, or in the Apostles' Creed this evening, the resurrection of the body. And one of the central ideas that Luke wants to convey in Acts is that the resurrection or resurrection events happen repeatedly in the life of the early church. When we read tonight's story, Luke intends us to see the similarities with Jesus's resurrection. There is an angel, the guards are powerless to prevent it. The gates open of their own accord, just as the stone was rolled away and yet no one rolled it. We may believe in the resurrection of Christ and that it has a profound impact on us now, but what exactly does it mean? And what does this story from the early church tell us about what the resurrection means? Why is it that Peter is saved and James is ex executed? It's very difficult to understand. And in the end, I can't explain it. But I think there are a couple of things that help me to think about it. Firstly, Jesus' resurrection from the dead and our baptism into it does not mean that we will not grow old and die. Whereas when, whereas when Jesus was raised, clearly after the resurrection, he does not age and he can't be harmed and he's quite different from, or there are some important differences between him as he was before the crucifixion and him as he is after the resurrection. For us, as we share in his resurrection through our baptism, it's not quite the same. 
we will all die one day, one way or another. So the power of the resurrection is not a power to save us from death and aging. Hence Peter and in the Gospels, Lazarus and the son of the widow of Nain, though they are resurrected and raised from the dead on one occasion, will continue to age and ultimately they die as we all will do. So why does God act to save sometimes and not others? In the end, only God knows the answer to that. We are challenged to believe, but we're not sure what to believe. Even after the resurrection, there is ambiguity and a mystery about how God works in the world. In many ways, I think things are even more mysterious. I think for us as disciples pursuing this line of questioning, ultimately we are asking the wrong questions. Being a disciple is not about understanding the mystery of God and God's ways in the world, but rather it is about living a life in relation to God that takes God seriously, and in doing so we find our experience and the world is transformed. So the better question I think to ask of this story and more generally of resurrection is what does the story of Peter and James tell us of faith and how we live in the world in the light of the resurrection? And here I think Peter shows us something very important. He does not assume that God is going to save him, although I'm sure that he, like the church, had been praying fervently from the time he was arrested. But he is open to the possibility of the kingdom of God breaking through into this world and into his life and circumstances. While, we while Peter knows that James died, when he finds himself in a similar predicament, he is able to see that God is acting and to respond when it happens. Unlike most people in the scriptures, when he is confronted by an angel, he is not frozen with fear. Rather the opposite, he responds decisively and immediately. He gets up and follows the angel as the chains fall off. And he is able to follow the angel out of the prison and into the street. When Peter becomes aware of God's presence and action in his life, he responds, he acts, he moves, he walks and takes back the freedom that God offers him and returns to his friends. I wonder if someone who had not spent all that time with Jesus, who had not witnessed the resurrection, would have been able to act so decisively in the manifest presence of God. Maybe somebody else would have just turned over and gone back to sleep. Believing in the resurrection and being a disciple is not believing that nothing bad can ever happen. So much as being open to the possibility of God breaking through in the world and trusting and having confidence in the ultimate power of God's goodness and love to prevail over all that is lost and broken and wrong. In the world and our lives. Let us pray. Lord our God, as we ponder the mystery of your resurrection, give us hearts and eyes open to your presence, Help us to recognise where you are in our lives and to respond with alacrity. In the midst of the chaos and confusion, the pain and difficulties that sometimes affect, affect us in life, keep our hearts steadfast in their faith in you. Give us hope that you will be with us and that you will show us the way. 
and help us to trust that your goodness will always prevail. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our world, for those places of grief and imprisonment and pain and sorrow. We ask you, Lord, to deliver us from the pandemic, to heal those who are sick or suffering. We pray for the work of scientists and doctors and nurses and all those who are working for both finding good treatments and to find a vaccine for this terrible disease. We pray particularly for those who are in countries with inadequate healthcare systems, for those who will find that the catching the disease is something that they have little chance of getting any effective treatment for. We pray for aid agencies and all those who are seeking to relieve the suffering of those affected by the virus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for the economic well-being of our nation and our world. We pray for a spirit of cooperation and collaboration between the powerful of the world to support and enable the well-being, economic well-being of all people. We pray particularly for those who are in debt, who feel lost or hopeless, or those who have become enslaved through being indebted. And we pray for liberation for all those who are in debt today. And we pray particularly for any who are enslaved. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We bring before you, Lord, the needs of all those who are sick or suffering. And we've been asked to pray especially for Jilly Braybrook, Jenny Backer, Jane Sinclair, Peregrine Lavington, Annie Oliver, Peter Mosley, Doris Turk, Betty Packham, and John Stevens. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray also for those who've died recently and all who grieve them. May they know the light and hope of your resurrection in the midst of the darkness of their grief and loss. And remember especially the families of John Perring, Johnny Hearn, William Fuchs and Doris Fre Doreen Freedom, Freeman. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And so as we pray, let us ask God to help us to know his presence with us in the week that lies ahead. Let us commend ourselves, our time and our talents to his service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now let us pray for one another in the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Um, we are not obviously able to pass around the plate online um, when we have services, but um, if you're not a regular giver to St Mary's and you'd like to make a contribution to our ministry you can go to our website and you'll find there uh, is a give now button that you can use to donate to the work of the church. Our voluntary, I'm not sure who's playing our voluntary this evening I'm afraid um, but I, we will find out very shortly. Uh, do stay on after the voluntary and um, we will break, go into breakout rooms and have a chance to catch up with one another and have some time for fellowship. But in the meantime, may you have a very good week.